let's talk about some applications of double integration. The first one we're going to look at is area computations. That might surprise you because we've used double integrals to compute volumes. So what do I mean by area computations? And let's look at these examples. So first, let's start with just a single dimensional integral. So let's integrate from a to b 1 dx. I could anti-differentiate that and get x. We're going to plug in the bounds b and a. So overall, it's not very surprising. We get b minus a. What is this geometrically? It's the width of the interval that we integrated over. OK, so let's look at some double integrals. Suppose I want to integrate 1 dy dx over the rectangle x is between a and b and y is between c and d. Our integrand function is 1. I could think of that as 1 times 1, factoring it into a product of a function of x and a function of y. So using a property of integration, this is actually a product of two integrals, the integral from a to b of 1 dx and the integral of c to d of 1 dy. Based on the line above, we know that that's going to be b minus a times d minus c. Now what is that? That's the area of a through b cross c through d. So it's the area of the rectangle that we integrated over. Take a second to look at these bounds of integration and try to sketch a picture. So see if you can visualize the domain that we're integrating over in number three. If you have a picture of the domain, then the result might not surprise you. For this integral, I'm going to anti-differentiate 1 with respect to y. The antiderivative is y. Plug in the top bound. And we're left with the integral from 0 to b of h minus h over b times x dx. We anti-differentiate that with respect to x. And we get hx minus h over 2b times x squared. Plug in the top bound of b and we get hb minus hb squared over 2b, which is actually hb minus hb over 2. And overall, that's b times h divided by 2. So if you sketch this region correctly, you should have sketched a triangle with base b and height h. Integrating 1 over that triangle gave us the area of the triangle. So number four, imagine I wanted to integrate one over the closed disk of radius r. Well, the closed disk of radius r is both type one and type two. We can view x as bounded between negative r and r. Those are the x-intercepts of the circle enclosing this disk. And then y is bounded between the lower semicircle and the upper semicircle. So those bounds would go from negative square root of r squared minus x squared through the square root of r squared minus x squared. And then we would be integrating 1 dy dx. Now we're not going to do this computation. You can probably anticipate what the answer would be. It's pi r squared. Now this integral is not very pleasant as written. It would be better to set up actually with polar coordinates. So I'll save that for a different lesson. The moral of the story is if you want to compute the area of a region in the xy plane, if you can set up the region as a domain of integration where you're going to integrate the constant function 1, then the result of your computation will give you that area. So let's set up a double integral that computes the area enclosed between the parabola x equals y squared and x equals 4. Here's the area we want to compute. We can view this as the domain for double integral. Okay, let's find these points of intersection. So when x equals 4, y must have been 2 or negative 2. You could set this up as a type 1 region where you say that x is between 0 and 4 and y is between negative square root of x and square root of x. But I would rather set it up as a type 2 region. In that way, we would view y is bounded between negative 2 and 2, and x is bounded between y squared and 4. I just think that's a lot cleaner. So this area is the integral from negative 2 to 2, the integral from y squared to 4, 1 dx dy. 
So we anti-differentiate first with respect to x. That's going to leave us with the integral from negative 2 to 2 of x, where we need to plug in the top and bottom bounds, and then we're left with an integral with respect to y. Okay, now we have the integral from negative 2 to 2 of 4 minus y squared dy. This is even symmetric with respect to y, so I'm going to write this as twice the integral from 0 to 2 of 4 minus y squared dy. So that's 2 times 4y minus y cubed over 3, which is 32 thirds. You may recall from single variable calculus that integration gave us a way to compute the average value of a function over an interval. So let me sketch a picture of what that means. Suppose this top curve here is the graph of y equals g of x over the closed bounded interval from a to b. The overall average output from a to b is what we call the average value of that function over that interval. And how we compute it is that number, the average value, is 1 divided by b minus a times the integral from a to b of g of x dx. How I would like to reinterpret this is b minus a is the integral of 1 from a to b. So I could reinterpret this as a ratio of integrals. So it's the integral of g divided by the integral of 1. Why is this the average value? Well, one thing to notice is that if you take that b minus a and multiply it over to the left, we can say that the average value of g times the width of the interval is the integral of g from a to b. Now that average value is like an average height, and b minus a is the width of the interval. So what the average value of this function is, is it's the height, so that if I were to draw a rectangle of that height over the same domain from a to b, this rectangular area would be equivalent to the area enclosed under the graph of g. And we have the same notion when we go up in dimension. As we've already seen, the area of d in the xy plane can be computed by integrating 1 over d. And note here I wrote dA, that's just our general area differential. You could think of that as dx dy or dy dx. I didn't want to be too specific. Then the average value or average height of a function of the form z equals f of x and y over the domain d is going to be some number, so it's an actual value, which is equal to the integral of f over d divided by the area of d. Or once again, you can write that as a ratio of integrals. So it's the integral of f over d divided by the integral of 1 over d. And again, by multiplying that denominator over to the left, we realize that that's giving us a height for sort of like a, a cylinder with base d, whose volume would exactly match the volume enclosed between the graph of f and the xy plane. So that's what we mean by average value. Our final application for double integrals comes from physics. So we would like to ultimately compute the center of mass of what we call a plane lamina. For now, you can picture that like a blob in the plane. Let's run through some vocabulary before we see how to set up and solve this type of problem. How do we calculate mass? Well, mass is density times Volume is how it's normally phrased. In this context, we're going to say it's density times area. So what is density? That's like how thick it is. And volume and area measure how much you have. So how thick it is times how much you have, that gives you your mass. The word moment describes how the mass is arranged or located relative to your coordinate system. So we measure that by taking mass and multiplying it by its displacement from a reference. Working in the xy plane, we need to measure two types of moments. What we denote as m sub y measures displacement off of the y-axis. So that sees how the mass is situated relative to the y-axis. Similarly, m sub x measures displacement off of the x-axis. then your center of mass, which I like to think of it as the point where if you had the blob and you wanted to balance it on your fingertip, 
This is where you would need to put your fingertip. We denote it as x bar, y bar. x bar is calculated as m sub y divided by m. Careful with the notation here, it's an easy place to get confused. And the y coordinate is m sub x divided by the total mass. The reason why these coordinates are what they are is when we measure displacement off the x-axis, we're seeing how the mass is situated horizontally. So if we take how the mass is situated horizontally and, and divide it by its total mass, that gives us the x-coordinate for our center of mass. Similarly, by measuring displacement off of the x-axis, we're measuring up and down, so that's measuring how the mass is situated vertically. That's why that measurement is associated with y-bar. Given those notions, let's see how to find the center of mass for a plane lamina. Here we're assuming there's some non-uniform density function, so our lamina doesn't have a uniform density at every point. Ra rather, we can calculate the density in the various regions of this lamina using sigma. So our density function is sigma of x and y. We'll do a quick derivation of this, it's real quick, in order to justify why we should calculate this notion with a double integral. So the first thing we should do is establish our coordinates. So let's say here are the x and y axes. Next, if we're solving this problem for the first time, what we might do is say, you know, I can't really describe this shape very well, but let's chop it up as much as we can into little rectangles. So that's like partitioning the xy plane to subdivide this lamina. Now to each subrectangle, including these irregular regions, what we can do is pick a representative point if we're indexing in the x direction with i and in the y direction with j. To each subdivision here, we'll pick some representative point xi star yj star and plug that into the density function so that we can say, well, the density across this subrectangle, since it's just a little piece, should be about sigma of xi star yj star then the mass of this piece would be that density times the area of the piece. Then we would add up that calculation across every subrectangle. So the total mass can be written as a double Riemann sum, adding up in the x direction and the y direction to cover every subrectangle, of the density function evaluated at a representative point chosen for each subrectangle, times that subrectangle's area. So again, this is a mass computation because this is density, and then we're multiplying it by area. If we were to partition this finer and finer, so if we let the number of chops in the x and y directions go to infinity, then if this double sum converges, it would converge to a double integral, which would be the double integral over this domain d of sigma of x and y times dA, where that would be like dx dy or dy dx. So this is how we will compute our total mass. The moment m sub y for this lamina measures how the mass is situated horizontally. So what we do is we take that density function and we scale it by x. And the reason why we scale it by x is because that's measuring the displacement off of the y-axis. So this is like finding some sort of distribution horizontally. Similarly, m sub x would be calculated by taking the double integral of y times sigma of x and y. After computing really three integrals here, so we have the total mass, m sub y, and m sub x, then the coordinates of the center of mass, the place where you could balance this lamina on your fingertip, is once again denoted x bar, y bar, and it's m sub y divided by m, that gives you the average x coordinate, and then m sub x divided by m to get your average y coordinate. Let's do a quick example. Let's find the total mass of the lamina in the first quadrant bound by y equals zero, x equals zero, and the graph of f of y equals negative y squared plus nine with a mass density of sigma of x and y equals one plus y. Okay, so the first thing to do is sketch a picture. So here is our first quadrant, x and y. Here the function we're given is really like x is a function of y, that's a parabola opening to the left. 
Consequently, the y-intercept is 3, the x-intercept is 9. So this shape in here is our lamina. Since x is given as a function of y, let's treat this like a type 2 region where the constant bounds for y will go on the outside. So we'll say m is the integral from 0 to 3, that's the minimum y to the maximum y. The integral from 0 to 9 minus y squared, because again going in the increasing x direction, for a choice of y value we enter the region on the y axis, that's where x equals 0, and we exit the region on the parabola x equals 9 minus y squared. We integrate our density function, 1 plus y, and then the differential should be ordered dx dy. At this point it's a routine double integration, so we're just going to compute the antiderivative first with respect to x, plug in our top and bottom bounds, we get the integral from 0 to 3 of 9 minus y squared plus 9y minus y cubed dy. Now it's a single integral with respect to y. Anti-differentiate again and we're left with this. Just go ahead and plug in 3 and I think I'll leave it there. So this would be the total mass of this lamina. You would repeat the process to find the moments. So I could take this integrand and just multiply it by x, repeat this integration to find m sub y, or I could multiply by y, repeat the integration to find m sub x, then we divide those moments by this total mass calculation in order to compute the center of mass. Thank you for your attention.